Okay, we're, we're on live. Okay, so, you know, um, it's a very interesting topic, um, doing things, and I can relate it to, uh, to some of my things, like writing a book, uh, which was something that wasn't life and death, but what was, it was inspired, actually, and, um, you know, procrastination and sloth around things you don't want to do as well, and also adrenaline, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, power versus force, or adrenaline versus power, shall we say, adrenaline versus power, um, and also being an addict, being an addict, uh, in my addiction days, I wouldn't do anything unless it was the last minute for everything, you know, because, uh, <clears throat> you know, studying, studying for exams, nothing until the last, I'd just be stressed out about it, and then start studying towards the end. And addicts tend to be uh, a more extreme scenario of waiting till the last minute to do things. I think normal people are a little bit more sane. Um, the thing was, I got, you know, the thing that I, you know, uh, with procrastination, or <clears throat> I just share my experience, which I think is useful because it's a spiritual group. You know, in addiction, where um, basically I always want to use on something. Um, and uh, I'm always, I was also working in the stock market, which is like adrenaline junkie land. And uh, so the thing of um, adrenaline is very, very good for productivity until you nearly die and burn out and get kidney failure. So actually it does work. I mean, I was super, super, super productive uh, living on adrenaline. And I do remember the last days, I just quickly share it, because it was like, you know, your system gets used to living on adrenaline, mm. and it's like, and that's what you're used to. You don't, I didn't realize I was on a, on a, on a very high octane drug, non stop. And it, it's like an anesthetic. Adrenaline is like an anesthetic, you know, it numbs you out from everything, and you feel like a super achiever, like a god or something, and you just go through, through the day. And then I remember right towards the end, I could feel like and I know now it was my chi energy leaving my body. It was like everything was depleting out of me. It was all the life force. My last life force was just draining out of my body. There'd be nothing left because I was just uh, going on super adrenaline. And then I got the kidney failure. And then all of a sudden, you know, I got to, um, after that near-death spiritual experience, and I got to meet Dr. Hawkins, who had recovered from 23 illnesses through using Course in Miracles and various other things. And I, I learned the thing of the, um, you know, and, and he uses muscle testing. For anyone who doesn't know muscle testing, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm in any form of addiction, whether it's anger, fear, adrenaline, trying to control outcomes, my body goes weak. You know, you just check your adrenaline, super uh, fear, anger, shame, your muscles collapse. And I remember an acupuncturist, saying to me, when I was just starting out with acupuncture, saying, whispering in my ear, saying that, oh, fear, you know, kidneys, that's the meridian with fear associated with, with the thing. So it was obvious that God was saying, you've been in super fear and adrenaline and addiction your whole life, and that's blown you out. So for me then, to stay alive, literally, so I'll share this, to stay alive, I can't afford very long in fear, adrenaline, uh, shame, guilt, or anger, because if I do that, I'm going to blow out my meridians, and I've lost the privilege, you know, things can go pear-shaped for me very, very quickly, I have to stay connected to God, and whether it's fear, adrenaline, whatever, I can no longer operate on those, it's a life and death thing, so, but then, you know, the thing of like, um, so I just wanted to share that, so every time you do adrenaline, um, I mean, People can have a few years of adrenaline left in them, and you can use that as a super productivity thing until you've lost the, you've lost the privilege to use it anymore. I've lost the privilege, so I can't afford it. But what I can share is that peace, you know, doing things in peace, um, doing things from a level of peace is interesting. There's quite a lot of distinctions, because obviously when you're peaceful and still, you don't feel... I mean, there's no urgency to do anything. It's like, well... How are you? I'm chilled out and peaceful, you know. Uh, do you want to, you know, like suddenly saying to someone who's chilled out and peaceful and meditated for three hours, like, okay, like write a dissertation right now. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's not that, it's not like, it doesn't seem that urgent to like sort of go there because you're in, as you go to higher spiritual states, it's like the, de the ego deactivates. You stop tracking your thoughts 
And so, um, so, so it's learning, you know, the two realms are very different, like being very much in your head and using adrenaline, and then just being in the infinite stillness and allowing things to flow out of that. And then also there's another medium of like utilizing the two levels together uh, for practical reasons. I mean, I wouldn't really want to use my ego for, like I prefer not to ever use it, but sometimes if you're like doing taxes or you're doing like a, a project, uh, you're, 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 you're doing like a coaching exams and you have to get a whole dissertation of 8,000 words, you know, just being chilled out in bliss. Um, so now uh, I'm going to sort of think, so there are, I want to share a few different tricks. One of the things, as you go higher in levels of consciousness, as you work on your spiritual program, because here's the few distinctions. One is things which are meaningless are effortlessly done. Things which are meaningful, there's like resistance to doing them. Like if someone said to me, your life depends on boiling a kettle right now, I could stay in the observer, I could stay in peace, total stillness, not even use my ego, and intuitively, effortlessly put a kettle on, and I wouldn't even engage my ego. I'd still be in this eternal stillness. We do the exercise of the observer later on. It's, I, for me now, I can talk in the observer, I can put a kettle on in the observer, I can hold discussions in the observer. But when it comes to, think, you know, but that takes practice, you have to practice. Now you can, um, uh, for easy things, uh, you know, I'd encourage practicing and feeling out the feelings, being in the observer and cancelling all beliefs. So let, let's take, uh, for example, I'm doing a dissertation uh, for coaching and they give me some like stupid topic which I'm not inspired about, like, you know, talk about whatever and write 9,000 word dissertation. Uh, and uh, so, um, I mean, I'd probably use something, if I, if I wasn't feeling inspired and wanting to do it, I'd probably use, um, well actually I'd use a number of different tools which I've learned from the fellowships. One is, um, like when I did my book, um, one of the things I've learned is like daily commitment, you know, and that I found, like I've got a lot of things in my life which has helped me to do is like have a daily commitment. And I intuitively knew, like with writing a book, the most important thing was not to do what I do as an addict, which is like to binge on work and just have, you know, just be stressed out because I'm not doing work for three weeks. And then saying to myself, well, I'll work the whole day, 24 hours tomorrow to binge out. Because that for me is like using adrenaline. I for myself, I can't afford to use it. Other people can. I can't. I just have to avoid adrenaline. I have to use power. I have to somehow work without engaging adrenaline or fear as a motivator. Now, if you're an addict, you still may be able to do those. Or in my addiction days, I'd use food. I'd eat Big Macs to fuel, uh, or sugar or something, to fuel some work. I can't afford it anymore. So as you get more spiritual, you have to use different means. So one is, um, so I would, now, why is sloth, sloth or resistance or procrastination happening? Well. You know, if, some, if I said to you, like, uh, put the kettle on, even if you didn't want to and you didn't find that inspiring, you could still do that. You know, so what's the problem with writing, like, a 9,000 pound dissertation, which is going to take, I don't know, hours or days or whatever it is. Right? Well, the thing is, there is unconscious, bag there'll be definitely unconscious baggage and outcomes associated with that, which are tied into the ego. So what I found is, because I had to, from... Uh, had to like do things on peace without resorting to adrenaline and addiction to do things was I found that uh, so the mystical started to happen I know this is not always I'll, I'll try and talk about the practical when you're forced to do it to a deadline and when you're not forced to do it to a deadline when I'm not forced to do it to a deadline I'll work on my resistances to doing the work so if I have unlimited time I'll, I'll, I'll write down all my outcomes, why I feel I want to push myself to do it. Uh, put them all on paper. I'll write down what I find meaningful or unmeaningful, around, you know, all the meaningful things I've got about writing a dissertation. And I'll, I'll put those into God's infinite life and love, or I'll cancel my beliefs around them, I'll cancel the outcomes. And I found that when I sort of, um, it's like there is an intention to do it. Uh, here's the thing, there is an intention to do it. 
but I'm just cancelling all the meaningful stuff and all the outcomes because I know that creates a baggage to doing it. You know, like doing something, there's an unconscious baggage to do things. Like for some things, there's no unconscious baggage. But for other stuff, there's a lot of meaningful baggage, outcomes and meaning associated and future outcomes. Like, oh my God, I'm going to finish this dissertation, I'm going to get the certificate, and then my life's going to be amazing. So it's a future outcome. Life doesn't start now, but life will start when I've done the 9,000 words and got the certificate. So that's how my ego thing. But then, when I have outcomes in the future, I feel more and more procrastination. Because it now builds up to be something important to do. And, and it, the outcome is very important as well. Uh, and also, when, it, when it's meaningful, there's no flow or effort, effort, effortfulness around it. It's like, it's important work, you know, I can't screw it up, or, or it's needed. So I want to, and I found that when I, even if I can't be bothered to work on it, if I work on spiritually releasing my resistance to doing the work, what I usually find, at a certain critical point, I'll just suddenly effortlessly start doing work on it, and it will just come in a very, eff you know, and I found that like with taxes, you know, I suddenly like wake up and it will just all happen and I hardly did it myself. So it's like, you just work on the resistance. So I'll do like, I call them step tens and I'll go, uh, and I do this thing or prayer. Like, you know, I have to do the taxes, but I won't do the taxes. I'll just be, every day I'll be putting my procrastination, my fear, my belief that I have to do the, I'll also put in my trauma of what's being fined for making a mistake. Put it all into God's infinite light and love. Pray for miracles and transcendence. Cancel my belief. It's important work. Sit with any feelings of... If I, I'll use the exercise of the feel of feelings. Is there, like a, is there a subtle feeling of resistance to doing this? So I'll just close my eyes and just connect to the energy of resistance or sloth. Sometimes it can be very subtle. And if you're in your head, you won't be able to locate the feeling of sloth, resistance. I'm just, I'm just trying to feel that out. Clear the baggage, the outcomes, and the meaning around it. And then one day I'll wake up, and it'll be the miraculous. It's like, I, it's like my ego won't do it. It will just suddenly happen. So that's one thing. I found with the book, where it's like a long time, unstructured, like daily commitment, which is doable, and committed. And also sharing that with other people in my spiritual community. I also found having an action buddy was very useful. But I committed when I was doing my book, five minutes every day, non-negotiable and I knew that I couldn't find any excuse not to do fine and I learned this thing of like I learned this thing which I found from my own spiritual experience which is daily commitment never break a daily commitment when you make a daily commitment this is just me but it's like stick to it but do something you can and I always found with daily commitment start very small and then build up with meditation. I'd start with one, you know, a few minutes, and then build it up to an hour or something like that. I knew with the book, just do five minutes. And I said, as long as you do the five minutes, and I'd even like be late in the day, and I'd do my little five minutes just to make sure. But it do, it just doesn't have a. When I found that one, and this is also to do with the Course in Miracles as well. It's to do with everything. I found when I have a daily commitment, if I break, I knew not to break daily commitments, which are important. So the book then became an important thing. Five minutes was something I could not, and I committed to that five minutes, so, and the book got done. It took four years, I think, so it wasn't a quick thing. But I found on some days, when I did the five minutes, I would go on, and I think if I hadn't had that five minute thing every day, on the good days, I wouldn't have, you know, gone on. On the bad days, when I was feeling very resistant to everything, I still did the five minutes, and that's the same with my Course in Miracles thing. Um, as a hypnotherapist, just to give a few other tricks, um, I think when you're asking, when you're inspired to do something, I mean, for everyone it's easy, you know, it's like, you know, but when you're doing something that you feel you want to do and you think it would be good for you but you don't want to do, uh, you, get, you get sloth and procrastination, like if it's a, let's have just fun and dance or something, that might be easy for everyone, but you know, write a 10,000 word dissertation in the next two months. You know, I don't know how many people find that effortless fun. But, um, is, um, I forgot what I was talking about. So is, yeah, so daily commitment and uh, taking out, taking out, uh, oh, so visualization as a hypnotherapist. You know, I think this ties in, visualization is also quite powerful, set in, 
together with silent intention. So it's like I set a silent intention that I will get my dissertation done. It's like, but that's a silent thing within, before the ego. It's going to get done, you know, so that's one thing. Then the next thing is, on my daily spiritual practice, clearing all the resistances I have, working on my sloth on a spiritual level, like feeling out the sloth, cancelling the meaning I give to future outcomes. Because my future outcomes are just thoughts which are meaningful. So the f first lesson in Course in Miracles, all my thoughts are meaningless. When I have to do something meaningful, then I get all kinds of crap come up. You know, if I had to talk in front of a bunch of three-year-olds and give a talk mm -hmm. on astrophysics, you know, I wouldn't worry if I made a mistake. I'd be quite effortless. I'd probably tell them some crap and I wouldn't worry about it. If I'm like having a bunch of Oxford professors sort of marking me at the end of it, but that's just projection. That's the meaning I project onto the scenario. You know, that's my internal meaning. So when I cancel my ego projections, then I start to get effortless flow. The other thing I want to do for advanced spiritual seekers who go into the observer and then get frustrated they can't write a dissertation because they're in the observer, is I've learned this thing of like um, engaging the ego. Even though this group is not about engaging the ego, I call that tracking. Now, if you go, uh, go into a very bliss state where, you know, you're just feeling blissed out and you just want to sit on the chair and chill out, and then uh, suddenly you have to cross the road, because you're not tracking anything, you're not tracking phenomena anymore. So it's still a real world. So until in the early days, you've got to, until the observer is able to master uh, crossing a road, you've got to track from your ego so you can engage your ego. What that means is tracking thoughts. I hope that this is simple. So if you're like, hard, you've got hardly any thoughts and you want to do something because you've been meditating for six hours non-stop and you're in a blissful state, is you can actually, all you have to do, because of the levels of consciousness, if you want to pull yourself down to more ego levels, start identifying with thoughts, you know, um, and then that will pull you, and you just pull down to tracking with thoughts until you feel you've got what's intuitively you need to engage the ego from. But I'll also say that when you get to more advanced levels, even the observer or those non-dual states are able to do quite sophisticated tasks. But in the early days, you sometimes have to engage your ego to do something. Um, so, yeah, having, you know, having accountability, having a spiritual buddy. <clears throat> um, I have got a, I've, got, I've got sponsors in 12-step fellowship, so I can just write, I'll say, I'll say to them, do you mind if I also, on my daily inventory, share that I've done my five minutes? They never say no. But I feel like, a, it's kind of like a thing, you know, it's like, it's just like a, a reinforcement to help, help you have spiritual... Also, this thing that Hawkins said, you know, when people witness what you're doing, you get more power. Um, and he said this thing on Biscuits. I think it was on Biscuits. It's in one of his DVDs. He said this thing of, like, it was so beautiful. Uh, <laughs> it's not for the overeaters, but anyway. <laughs> um, um, he said, like, or oh, when you're trying to give up... He said, just witness, just keep account of it, but just witness it. Not with, an, not with an intention to do anything with it, but that you're tracking it on a daily basis. And it, it breaks it down, it breaks down, the mystical is more likely to happen. I know it sounds a bit odd. So for me, it's like, um, I thought that if I witness what's happening with, uh, with it and someone else is witnessing it, then it, there's more likely for miracles to happen. So I, I do that generally with my spiritual sponsors. It's like I'll share stuff and I know that their spiritual power at their witnessing level, if they witness my crap, um, I, I get more than just keeping it and my, my witnessing doing it. So, um, but yeah, you can also visualize. Um, I'll just quickly share how I do visualization. I tend not to do visualization. I only do visualization with one thing, that's my health. And I've had the miraculous happen. I I'm tend to be like very resistant to doing it like for lotteries or visualizing, I don't know, or material stuff. But I have done it for health. The thing is just to visualize it and then let it go without any, uh, without any outcome to it. So it's just like you just tell God the, the visualization, but you have, no out, you have no fixity of I want that thing. So you just make the visualization and surrender it. So you could have the visualization of 
the, um, the dissertation being done and visualising it being done and feeling good about it, but then release it without any expectation. Because when you want something to do, that's a resistance. So when you go to God with a needy energy and demand it of God to give it to you in the future, then that, that's going to have a, that's going to be, um, the resistance of wanting is the energy of I don't have it. So not to do it with that, with that energy. So, yeah.